Okay, good evening. Um, gives me great pleasure to welcome Sanjeev Vidyarthi here to speak to us as part of the South Asia Initiative's um, series on urbanization. Uh, as you know, they run a series of uh, lecture sort of events around questions of water, entrepreneurship, and urbanization, and the urbanization bit happens here at the GSD, which we enjoy very much. Usually, for introductions, when speakers send you CVs, they sort of look like tenure cases, and then you distill stuff out of this stuff and kind of make an introduction. But when Sanjeev sent me his uh, CV, it was so personalized, and it was so wonderful, and it was so personal and yet sort of connected to the world that I thought I'm just going to read it out. And I think you'll enjoy it because I think it's, it really covers and describes him extremely well and his accomplishments. So, so to quote Sanjeev. <laughs> Sanjeev Vidyarthi has lived, worked, and studied in India, the Middle East, Europe, and the United States, and trained as an architect, urban designer, and urban planner. Uh, Sanjeev grew up in the industrial township of the Nairovian era near the historic city of Udaipur. He attended the JJ School of Architecture in Mumbai, where he met the big city and his future wife, and earned an honors degree in 1991. He then joined the college. Uh, he joined his college friends at Jaipur, a uh, city planned in the 18th century, which now serves as the capital of Rajasthan state. And together, they went on to establish the leading architectural practice of that state. In fact, it was really a a large uh, and incredible firm, <coughs> collaborative in nature and engaged in a whole range of projects. It really, for the time that it was established in India, there weren't many practices uh, of that scale and I think it really was unique. And, and over the next few years, this firm uh, branched out into fields of construction management, computer-aided visualization, all sorts of things, uh, and grew. In 1998, uh, his firm, and that means his collaborators in the firm, organized the first architecture school in the state of Rajasthan, which was based in Jaipur, which continues to operate even since um, Sanjeev hasn't been there. He served as the founding chair of the School of Architecture. Things move swiftly with the arrival of a long-awaited daughter, Anandita, and the turn of the century when the Vidyarthis began to realize they probably succeeded at the wrong life. Uh, and so this was the life change moment and in 2002 Sanjeev headed back to school as a student uh, for a master in architecture in human settlements uh, in Lumen where Kelly I think you were you overlapped there right and so she was a teacher there in Belgium uh, followed by a master of urban planning and a doctor of philosophy in urban technology and environmental planning from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor where we overlapped uh, and his doctoral research supported by a junior research fellowship from the American Institute of Indian Studies, uh, which sort of began to investigate uh, this American neighborhood unit concept in India and explain how, why different urban actors appropriated the concept over time. And this is going to be uh, the subject of his uh, talk. Uh, apart from city building processes, his research and teaching interests include physical planning, urban theory, design, globalization, and development. Studies. Today, he is uh, based at the University of Illinois in Chicago and is an assistant professor in, in urban planning and policy. So, with that, uh, I welcome Sanjay. That was a long introduction. Uh, I didn't know Ravan would be reading what made him from it. Uh, uh, but that sort of gives a personal uh, frame within which this, this research sort of took place. And I think that that's important here. Um, I grew up in one of these neighborhoods uh, way back. And sort of uh, when I started uh, thinking about my doctoral research, this was, and this was uh, the kernel of, of this research sort of already existed and animated my interest as to what uh, what happened to these neighborhood units over time, and to begin with, where did they come from? And that, that's what is the focus of the talk. Uh, essentially, a book in making. Uh, hopefully, I won't. Uh, I would be. Um, I would have more time to sort of devote to this project. Uh, it's been uh, long in the working, like most research projects are. Uh, but I want to quickly. I don't want to spend too much time on this, as I mentioned around about 35, 40 minutes. Uh, the talk would essentially move around three, 
three major uh, headings. I want to talk about the idea of plant neighborhoods and its travel to independent India. I want to spend a little bit more time on the role of plants in, in the transfer of this idea, and a little bit on the role of other actors. And then I want to discuss one case uh, of a planned neighborhood which was actually built in the 1970s and, and highlight some of the city building processes which have changed. <coughs> <coughs> Neighborhoods like this sort of started pop, popping up across urban India in 19, starting 1960s. Uh, this is one in Jaipur, 1970s. Um, you would see them in, in Mumbai, you would see them in Delhi, you would see them across urban India. Uh, when, and I grew up, as I said, in one of these. In 2007, it looked something like this. And the only thing which had remained the same was this electrical <laughs> chain here, which I have highlighted in red. Otherwise, you can see the urban fabric had changed dramatically. From single family homes, uh, you had multi generational homes, you had some of these buildings had been bought over by builders, and you had apartment complexes. And, and the house street interface. <coughs> Uh, so very important for Siam and, and the modern movement had changed almost completely. <clears throat> Not only uh, these neighborhoods had changed internally, but most of the places where they were built, uh, the, the construction labor had, had made their shanties right next to them. So this is 1970s, the same time that this was being constructed. And in 2007, when I was doing my field work, this informal settlement looked like this. Uh, the houses had, it had been legalized, so as to say. Many houses here had, had titles to their property and people had constructed almost proper homes, as is evident in this. So not only the building of these planned neighborhoods initiated a whole range of city building processes within, <coughs> but also around in the vicinity. So we are talking not only of isolated neighborhoods, but, but processes which are taking shape at the subsidy level. <coughs> Um, Jaipur was not isolated. So this is uh, Chen, one of the uh, series of uh, houses designed by Jane Drew and Maxwell Fry in Chandigarh in the 1960s. Same idea with the street house interface, the, the integrity of the material palette, um, and, and the clarity of the geometry. And when I visited this at the same time, uh, in 2007, it had changed dramatically as well. Right? And one wondered as to what Bouzier would have to say about these arches here yeah, yeah, and the yeah. railings, right? <clears throat> the literature, on the other hand, which one reads in school, especially the post-colonial literature and the framework within which we talk, these ideas, the idea of master plan, right? Um, the idea of planned neighborhoods, the idea of comprehensive planning are sort of shown as ideas which were superimposed on that part. Mm -hmm. And that's how the literature described it in 60s and 70s. On one hand, I was reading this literature. And on the other hand, I was sort of seeing that if it was superimposed, then people have changed it dramatically to the extent that it is no longer the case of superimposition, but acute adaptation, where it has been internalized, as I will show you, uh, both in discursive practice. So Indian planners today do not recognize neighborhood unit concept as something which came from the United States in 1950s, or master plan, which is an externality. But very much within the part of the planning system. And, and this, these ideas sort of within the post-colonial paradox sort of show up in terms of formal practice, where uh, unlike the United States, where master plans do not have legal sanctity. Zoning has legal sanctity and can be held uh, on account by a code of law. But in India, master plans have a legal sanctity, and the courts have sort of the increasing interventionist role of course has sort of prompted the state to move in and try to move many of these incongruities. So things which were not planned and which have happened later on. And that's where the post-colonial paradox shows up in formal planning practice. Um, these series of images come from, from Delhi, uh, where the Supreme Court ordered the government of Delhi to, to, remove, uh, to remove these unplanned, several of these unplanned uh, phenomena and also to seal the properties which, which had been converted against what the master plan recommended. <clears throat> now the story of all of this sort of starts somewhere in, in 1920s in the United States. 
the neighborhood unit concept was the first time published in, in the regional plan of New York, and it's in Moines. It was conceptualized by an American planner called Clarence Perry. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, essentially a template to design physical space. It was a very simple concept, as you can see. Six design principles, the size, about 5,000 residents. Boundaries, so the idea was that you have clear arterial streets on all the sides. So the, so the neighborhood unit has a sanctity of its own. Um, open spaces, which are sort of hierarchically divided. Each set of lots has an open space close to it. The idea of institutions at the center of it. Some local convenience shops at the corner and an uh, internal street system. Now this was sort of within a quarter mile walking radius that if you lived in one of these units, you could walk to a place. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of design concept, it was simple, but in terms of the discourse from the boom of which it was born was much more complex. So think of the American cities at the turn of the 19th century, right? So I don't want to spend too much time on it, but few key words. Chicago school, the idea of anomie in the industrial city, the idea that, that people have migrated from across the world into the squalor and the and the crime of Chicago and New York, right? And the and the the linkages between the individual and the household and the neighborhood and the general society have broken down. So to promote social group and to organize the city efficiently as cars have begun to show up. So the th so the thorough thorough thro traffic sort of goes through and does not enter these self-contained cells of the city. So efficiency and and essentially to break up. Anomi, which, which sort of ruled the day. Now, this discourse sort of crystallized in the template of, of this uh, uh, physical template of organizing space in terms of the neighborhood unit concept. Now, <clears throat> within the US, the, the concept was crit criticized um, 90 through 1940s and 1950s in, in terms of one that you are the architects and planners who employ this are essentially being physically deterministic, that by organizing the space spatially, we are trying to promote a certain kind of uh, social milieu. In terms of the second, and which was the major criticism, was that it promotes homogeneous neighborhoods. People of certain ilk stay together. Uh, and and Perry, Clarence Perry, the, the designer of the concept, himself sort of thought that that would be a good idea. If people who subscribe to similar set of ideas live together, it would create a homogeneous neighborhood, sort of, sort of a club of people. <clears throat> now, eventually in the post-war era, the, the idea of the suburban expansion would build on this, and, and the white flight from the cities and people of certain uh, status and people of certain color and ethnicity living together would create what Christo, Christopher Silver uh, on, his, uh, on his review of neighborhood planning would call sort of the stop planning item, where neighborhood unit concept gets inscribed in zoning and subdivision norms and master plans in the post war years. It's not only here, it sort of travels across the world. It shows up in China, it, sh it, it goes to UK and sort of serves as the template for the new towns designed in the UK after the post war. It shows up in Ghana, the new city of Tema's design on this. It shows up in Islamabad, uh, where, where uh, Doxiadis would use it to, to, to sort of lay the uh, new capital for Pakistan. And, and in India, where I would show it, it sort of becomes quite like the US, the stock planning item. Wherever planners have to design a new city extension or a new city, they would use the same item. So this, this sort of shows the India embarked on a major new city building program after independence. Shows something like 60 new cities. Uh, we know a few of them. Chandigarh, right up here. Uh, Gandhinagar, which was designed by Mewada, uh, trained at Urbana Champagne. Bhuvneshwar here, designed by Otto Kunitzberger. And something like six new steel cities. Um, and all of these sort of use the same idea for organizing the residential mass of the city. <clears throat> it's not only the it's on, not only the idea of creating new cities, but the larger discourse at this point of time in post-independence India is modernization and development. Um, 
Nehru sort of thinks, and this is this is a critique which sort of comes from the influential subaltern studies collective, that a, a group of indigenous elite, spearheaded by Nehru in many ways, sort of took over the reins of the country after country's independence. And the idea was to catch up with the West. And then development in this scheme sort of becomes the ladder on which you would count your progress towards catching up. Neighborhood unit sort of builds within this discourse, right? It is the idea here is that you need the middle class, and this middle class would be would be best incubated in these spatially organized and physically disciplined uh, new <coughs> extensions. Uh, most of the residents in these neighborhood units in 1970s would would be either coming from the walled cities, from the old historical quarters, or they would be coming from from rural areas. And if they live in in a or in a spatially organized physical space, it would have a civilizing effect. People would know to use the park. People know that they have to throw the garbage at the right place, and and the the lesser privileged would run from you know the better of people who sort of educated and so on and so forth. <clears throat> now the first transformation of the concept, right? So think of the way it was conceptualized in the United States for a very different purpose, coming from a very different literature. Take the same concept and you sort of reframe it within the discourse on modernity and, and modernization and development. So, so the first sort of transformation of the concept happened discursively uh, in this respect. And then I sort of spent a, a good bit of time digging up the old archives. Uh, Ford Foundation sponsored the, the first um, major planning enterprise in India, the Delhi Master Plan, where a group of, of planners from the United States showed up and worked with a group of the first generation young Indian planners who work on Daily Master Plan and, and other archives to sort of examine how are Indian planners dealing with, you know, on one hand the West, the Western origins of this concept, and the, on the other hand of the rich urban complexity of Indian cities. What shows up, so Delhi Master Plan, it sort of shows what I'm calling two processes, translation of the neighborhood unit concept into indigenous languages, and, and translocation of the concept itself into, into the history of Indian cities. So Delhi Master Plan quotes, neighborhood units are similar to traditional mohallas and kuchas in the old city of Delhi, and in fact are found in rudimentary form in almost all of the Indian cities and towns. They say, no, 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 this idea is not really an American. We have had parallels and we have had analogous urban forms in rudimentary form in, in all cities. And this, when I, when I discovered this material, it intrigued me and, and I sort of began to interview some uh, senior Indian planners of, of, of that generation. This is a quote from what I'm calling a translator, the senior planner, uh, early 70s at that point. Uh, and, and he sort of explained that he knew this as a graduate student. He had read it as a planning orthodoxy in school. But while working as a planner, he never felt that the idea had foreign origins. You know, it might have gone there from here. See, we had forms of neighborhoods probably not definable by Western spatial norms. But tell me, were these ancient mohallas and katras neighborhood units or something else, right? So there is that translocation of the idea itself into, into the patrimony of, of Indian cities. The second set of planners, whom I call internalizers, essentially, a newer generation who, who sort of, so this person says, so you know that foreign ideas do not work here. They might appear fancy in the beginning, but no, they can't work here. Perini's ideas might have been used by earlier planners, but now things are different. See, I studied the neighborhood unit in planning theory, but for my present research, we use our own norms. This sort of shows that the idea had been completely sort of internalized by the time I was doing my field work, was no longer seen as something which had, along with the master plans, mm -hmm. come from the United States in 1950s. The planning norms he referred to is, in, in, on the other hand, sort of had inscribed the neighborhood unit in a table <coughs> plan that most familiar with, right? So here are your principles. Uh, and this sort of comes from 90, 1955 uh, in the annual seminar series, which sort of published this handbook. And this is the first reference I found where, so planner essentially needs two numbers. So they need to know what density they want to plan on and how much area they would need in acres, right? 
and rest of the six principles are here. And you go boom, boom, boom. If we want to design a city extension for 20,000 people, this is the density we require and this much of area we need. Right? So the, the concept is inscribed in such a manner that there is no reference to Clarence Perry, there is no reference to the United States, there is no reference to the literature out of which it originated and, and it had been reduced to sort of a simple mathematical table. Now once that the internalization happened, then the concept got institutionalized through master plans, subdivision rules, planning norms, for example, this is this one in Kanpur, and I found several examples where these planned neighborhoods start popping up across, across India, beginning 1970s onwards. <clears throat> the second part of this talk sort of focuses on a built unit. Uh, uh, as to once these neighborhoods like this were built in 1970s, what has actually happened. And I spent quite a bit of time. There was a huge choice of cities, uh, as you can see in this map. Um, you can, any, any city extension designed after 1960s, uh, you can go to one of these cities. Uh, Chandigarh was a prime, was a prime case uh, waiting to be explored, but many others. And a major problem for folks who work on India would, would be, and especially independent India, is to find archival material. India has never sort of opened up what happened. So official files are not accessible to people. Most public institutions do not have an archive. Official files are also written on by serving officials. So they are officially secret. and They cannot be shared with general public. Um, the maps are missing. If, if you are lucky enough to sort of even find a map. Uh, and if you find a map, it's not easy to reproduce it because, you know, it, 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 like most planning documents, contains a lot of secrets which people may not want to share with you. So uh, the city of Jaipur sort of fitted the bill because uh, I had worked there for several years, as I mentioned. I sort of knew people and, and, uh, and friends who were happy to, to share uh, some stories with me. The city of Jaipur was also an interesting uh, location for this research just because that it this, unlike most of British India, the city of Jaipur was never directly colonized by British. It had continued to be an independent kingdom until 1947. That means you didn't have the civil lines, you didn't have the military lines which existed in other parts of India. There was no stark divisions between black town and white town. The, uh, and also the city in that part of the world is sort of known for its indigenous patrimony designed something like 60 years before Washington DC was planned by a law firm. So uh, 1727, which is pretty recent in the South Asian, in the South Asian timeline, and, and the city was designed in terms of what was later discovered and, and also sort of refined as the indigenous town planning principles of, of the Indian tradition. Uh, so if, if the city had had a trajectory of its own until 1947, and then these two American planning ideas show up, the master plan and neighborhood unit concept in the 1950s, uh, and they sort of become the de facto principle. What happens to them was probably uh, uh, Jaipur was one of the best cases. So this is the historic city of the city, as you can see, like most American cities, on a gridded plan, um, and, and uh, built, the built fabric, which is sort of the, the, um, the havelis with, with internal courtyard spaces and the post-independence expansion would take place outside this world city. Uh -oh. So here's the world city, and these, so when I was doing my field work, these planned neighborhoods had been developed after 1947. And this map incidentally showed the location of informal settlements, which are shown in black color. And I, I realized, so this map sort of came from late 90s, that wherever the planned settlements were built, informal settlements had begun to show up. And I then plotted also the more recent informal settlements. And you can see that as soon as they were making these planned neighborhoods, informal settlements were coming next to them, starting uh, almost mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> one of them, which I sort of I looked at several in detail. One of them was Jawahar Nagar, and I like the name because named after Prime Minister Nehru, right? Sort of uh, has a historical connotation to it. 
plan in early 1970s and it was comprehensively developed. That means that the land was acquired by the same government institution which also designed and developed and actually built these houses. The houses, the design of the houses sort of it still speaks to the idea of the modern palette in terms of the, the, the naturalness of the building materials, it speaks to the socialistic framework of the times, right, small tiny houses. Um, but they have some elements like the regularity of the subdivision, the front setback, uh, the idea of a single family, um, and this is quite like Chandigarh, uh, designed and organized in sectors. So five sectors here, uh, continuously free-flowing green open spaces, so a pedestrian could cross them, um, inscribed by uh, arterial road on all the sides, uh, and then a hierarchy of roads within. Um, schools would come up here, and mostly single-family homes, though some walk-up apartments of a couple of floors. <clears throat> In terms of the layout of the site, uh, and that's where the local building stone was coming from, as you can probably see. So hills at the back, some sand dunes, and the arterial road on this side. And between the hills and the actual site, were sand dunes on which this informal settlement had gradually come. Um, if you see in the aerial view, you sort of see this arterial road here and the informal settlement on this side and, and this planned neighborhood on this side. Um, like most good doctoral students, I had an approved proposal and prospectus and funding for it. And my site stopped here and I wasn't sure if I really wanted to do this and extend my fieldwork. Uh, but as I went about my field work, I realized that these two are not different settlements. This is one settlement. We might call them, they might have different legal standing. They might have been planned differently. But essentially, it is one settlement. And you can't sort of differentiate between the two in terms of what they contain. So this is a street view. Uh, it is the same street which divides the two. And there's a continuous back and forth uh, exchange of people. Uh, a lot of services which American, which Clarence Perry could not have even imagined. For example, supplying of fresh dairy milk, or or somebody to tend your garden, somebody to clean your utensils. Even Indian planners who would have imagined this, who could have known that that the residents of these planned neighborhoods would need these services, could not have imagined how to incorporate them in the neighborhood unit concept. Right. Uh, on the other hand, these people. Um, who, who needed jobs and who needed to be close to where the jobs were had to come here. And this is how this sort of, so kids from this area sort of play into the, the park and open spaces of the neighborhood <coughs> uh, of Jawar Nagar with the passage of time and since these people vote and in India poor tend to vote more than the, the rich ones, um, several of them have been formalized and sort of resemble, have begun to resemble houses on the other side of the neighborhood. Uh, the government has extended many of its welfare programs in the last 10 years. Uh, as you can see here, that's the midday meal program. Um, the municipal water supply has sort of shown up, electricity, telephone connections, and so on and so forth. So in many ways, we might call it informal because it was not planned in a design studio, but it has begun to show the, the ideas which we would sort of identify with formal. Um, when I spoke to these residents about some of these changes, Many of them pointed out that, you know, it is easy to sort of spot out that our illegality, but you need to check out the illegality on the other side <laughs> of the road as well, which shows up very interestingly. This is essentially, it was planned as residential. The, the black color shows here the conversion of residential land use in, in mixed land use. So that's the original house here tucked away. This person's taken it down built a commercial complex, a bazaar has developed here, uh, and, and people have done all sorts of things, including installing uh, air uh, cell phone towers on top of, of the buildings. <clears throat> and this sort of shows the kind of changes which have, which have happened at the finer grain level of individual houses. Uh, many of these houses have, have disappeared, as you can see. As the families have grown and as the wealth has sort of begun to percolate down. And this is faster beyond 1990s. And that shift is very clear to see. 
Uh, this house is <coughs> ironically named Nirvana, and this is named as the White House, which sort of show the range of imaginations, right? And this closely resembles the historical um, Haveli as one would anticipate in Jaipur, with commercial use on the ground floor, and a setback and a terrace with, with, uh, with arches on the top. <coughs> So while I was doing this field work and I interviewed this person who lived here, and this is uh, just to sort of give you an idea about, about the sort of the moral economy of some of these changes. That's, that's something which, which sort of uh, I think is at the heart of this is um, is I discovered that most of these open spaces now housed temples. And that was one thing which the community had, had done by themselves. Um, Perry, for Perry, the essential idea of putting those institutions at the heart of the neighborhood unit was to, to create social institutions around which community can sort of come together. And he had anticipated that school would be probably the best option to do that. Um, and the way Clarence Perry describes it in his monograph is think of the school, which is the real social and cultural center, of, of the community with the American flag flying high, right? So there is that nationalistic discourse about it, which surely would have made sense to Nehru in terms of the, the national flag on, on August 15th and Repu India's Republic Day um, flying high, and the school would serve as the center, the foci of the community. But it so turned out that the, the community had many, many temples, and all of them were illegal. None of them existed on, on paper. Many of them built with the with the with the funds that sort of came through official channels through the members of legislative assembly and the MP local area development scheme. They had electrical connections, water connections, um, and, and this they, they were not in the original plan, right? So if you sort of see the, nine, the plan from 1970s, it has open spaces, but they gradually appear over time and, and patronized by the, by the community. Um, and they have, they are not temples in in the way one would think of historical temples, but more as community centers. For example, this shows a, a yoga camp which is going on. It all, they also have tuition classes for the younger kids. They also, it's also the place where the, where the senior generation shows up in the morning and the younger ones who want to sort of hang out, members of opposite sex, or all they'll sort of show up in the evening. They have Dandia Ras competitions, and you know, a whole, it is, it's more of a social institution as Perry would have imagined, but not part of the secular polity of India, right? So they do not, they cannot exist there. And, and, the, and the courts, at some point of time, can say that, that the state needs to take them down. And then that would be an issue to think about. The moral economy of some of these changes sort of came clear unexpectedly when I had interviewed this person who, who complained after a few days, he had my telephone number, that his neighbor had was doing an illegal construction. You can see that there's no setback here. This person has eaten up all of this setback and then has not left any setback on the side too. Um, and, and if you can come and sort of help me what needs to be done. I, I met with this guy and I sort of explained that probably the, the first thing which you need to do is to complain. Call up the, the city hall, the municipality, let them know there is this encroachment going on. And then I didn't hear back from him uh, ever. Um, <laughs> and I go after a few days, and what's interesting, I don't have that photograph now, but this room was constructed here. His big problem was that once this building comes up, because of these windows, the privacy of this space would be lost. They spoke, and this person who was encroaching convinced this guy that it is better that you also encroach. So that, you know, <laughs> there's a room here, then the issue is solved. Your privacy does not get wired. And, and if that's the moral economy, then planners could not have imagined or planned for this sort of a moral economy, right? If that's the framework within which we are planning a neighborhood, then it's very difficult for, for planners to sort of, um, especially 1960s and 70s, hopefully they are smarter now, and sort of have noticed these changes, which from the finer grain level to the subsidy level show up in, in different forms. So some of the conclusions uh, which I sort of draw here, one is the un unanticipated role of actors involved in, in, in the planning process, right from planners to the individual house owners, um, which sort of speaks to divergent moral economies, which, which um, we 
which was not anticipated even at the master plan level or at the design in of, of these planned neighborhoods. Um, and then there are diverse modalities for producing social group. The school and the, and the park does not do it, but it's, it's the temple and it's, it's these, uh, these exchanges on everyday basis where people collaborate uh, upon encroaching and not complaining against an, an encroacher. Um, and then the authority of historical practices, which sort of goes to, to the idea of neighborly relations and the person not complaining and saying he's my neighbor, how can I complain against him and this would sort of work against our relationship. The idea of temples historically serving as a communal institution in that part of the world. Uh, and then the implications for literature. One of the things that sort of stood out most clearly for me was that the post-colonial framework fails to sort of explain. We, we think of, of the urban form of, of the third world cities as divided in binaries, the formal and the informal, the modern and the historical, right? Uh, planned and unplanned. Whereas here, the informal settlement has become formal over time, almost. And the formally planned settlement has become informal. And what we have is a very interesting urban form. And I think that's that's, that's a, a very interesting area of future research, that the city of Jaipur begins to appear like a patchwork quilt of differently planned areas, which have sort of, with the friction, have become to look alike. And which is, which is something we haven't sort of, um, have thought of from the, from, the, from the planned neighborhood to the master plan. And that's, that's where I think we need to start. Thanks, Sanjeev. Uh, so I think we should open this up to discussion. But sir, you raise a lot of issues. I love the moral economy question. But also the, the notion that these binaries are actually useless, because you begin to situate yourself and begin to construct theory around one aspect of that binary. And it's, it's a siloed condition, whereas the blur is much greater. But just to push that further, I mean, I was sort of remembering the sites and services schemes. So I mean. Some of these things you showed us, or neighborhoods you showed us, was one step up where at least the unit was built. But actually, it was no different <coughs> than the services where there's only a tap or a toilet. Or so I mean, just to push that idea of of, of, of the binaries and not locating each either of these binaries. I mean, what what do you think we can extract in terms of our approach to planning? I mean, I know that's a very broad question, but I mean, what are the beginnings of thinking about this differently? I mean, I, in fact, I. Uh, I almost think that, yes, I think the suggestion, because the density is different, is, is, is actually providing an armature. So that's something one can learn from, right? And yeah. be more open-ended about it. I just thought that would be a good way to get you to elaborate on that. Sure. One, one thing that sort of stood out for me was the, was the very framing of the post-independence planning, that, that everything which existed out of that framework automatically became in uh, and whereas I think that several of these patterns, for example, emergence of temples, the, the, the notion of, of the mixed land use, and, and people being happy with mixed land use, uh, in terms of the, the, the residents of these planned neighborhoods, almost unequivocally in, in the interview said that when they shifted, when they moved into these planned neighborhoods in the 70s, they were not the greatest places to live. Right? So essentially uh, close to the silent services, perception of these places. There were no bazaars, there were no fresh milk, no, um, and so and so forth. But now after 30 years of appropriation, they are probably the best neighborhoods in town. So the people vouched for the success of these neighborhoods, which sort of, I think, speaks to the idea that we, we probably a good way is to figure out what is the urbanity uh, which makes sense to people in that part. And I think a, a good lesson lies in, in the historical cities of it. At some level, that's that's a that's an urbanity people are familiar with and, and comfortable with. Though they might not be they might not be very happy with those densities, and and um, uh, and and um, the tightness of the built fabric. But somewhere in between there, um, and I think that's the that's um, that's that's the scale and that's the armature within which uh, people. That's that's sort of the sense I have uh, most. Okay, and as I open it up, I'm going to first sort of give Namita and Sai an opportunity to maybe ask questions or respond in some ways. 
Uh, they're both they're working, they're both PhD students. Namita is an architect by training and she's in the anthropology department, uh, looking at construction workers and labor, but also in the production of housing and size, sort of looking at questions of housing, but through government agency and, and subsidies and, and all of that. So I just thought that we've sort of talked a little bit about this and I thought we could start with some of their comments and then open it up. Well, uh, so Rahul also shared um, your paper with us, and uh, I, I enjoyed it greatly and enjoyed the talk uh, as well. And uh, I actually wanted to ask you questions uh, from both, and uh, also was hoping you'd say a little more about uh, the actual your, your dissertation work uh, because I really like the idea of appropriation as a trope that you used to. Uh, talk about historic, uh, the historic development of the Indian city, but also bring it to its present, where you talked about appropriation not only in terms of slum development <coughs> or minor adaptations, but also planners appropriating uh, the plan and making it more Indian, which you spoke about it in the beginning. And I thought that focus on the process of development and, and the bringing together of this, this dichotomous condition of planning and unplanning within it was very, very clever, and I'm hoping you sort of share that a little bit with the uh, with with the group as well. Um. I don't know that if if there was one boiler moment in the dissertation that was this when I sort of laid it out and I realized that almost every actor who was involved in this process, starting from the the first the young generation of planners um, and. There were several of them who worked on the Delhi Mass <coughs> Plan in, in late 1950s, um, and I and I interviewed several of them. They were they, they they were the only ones who were not probably the most happy about this because they sort of saw this shift and the and they thought that it worked against what they had conceived. But almost every other actor who was involved in this process changed the discursive idea and the built unit to the extent that it's impossible. For most of us, if we do not know this side of the story, to think <coughs> that this idea eventually came from New York in 1929, right? It, it bears no physical resemblance to the way it was conceptualized and put on ground. So, so the idea of, you, of, of conceptualizing it as an appropriation was not really a subversion by, and that's how uh, some of the post-colonial literature would frame it, that the poor subverted it. No, 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 no. It was every actor. It was the rich households. It was, it was the community of middle class people. It was the planners. It was the politicians, because several of these um, temples were sponsored by them. It, it sort of also spoke to, and which, which I didn't speak about. Uh, I'm always scared of the camera. But the dissertation <laughs> speaks about it is, is, the, is the politics of, of um, allotting some of these open spaces to a nephew or a brother or or to somebody for making hospitals and for some making you know other sort of other sort of um, build forms which which the plan did not envisage. So um, it, it's 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 a more robber story than some version. Did it answer the question? Yeah. Well, actually, I was just asking you to share that aspect of the writing with with the audience because I thought that was a very significant contribution that you made to the understanding of urban planning in India. Uh, I do have more questions. <laughs> or Sam, would you like to go first? Please? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Come back to you. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Sanjeev. I mean, it was terrific hearing this presentation from a very dear friend and an extremely intelligent scholar. Um, I have two questions. One to do with the circulation of planning ideas, and the second on the city building process. Uh, the first is the circulation of planning ideas. I mean, circulation of planning ideas is as old as globalization. Itself. And uh, when you're tackling this animal called globalization, the first question you ask is, how is globalization today different from how it was maybe 50 or 60 years back? And I wanted to ask the same question with the circulation of planning ideas, because you have a neighborhood unit which really traveled to India in a very particular moment, 1930s to 1960s, and we're in a different political economic context now we're in a different age of technology. So if you take a planning idea that's circulating now, that's very fashionable, how is the circulation different? Uh, <clears throat> I haven't thought much about it, right? So this is, um, this is, um, 
external at this point of time in the frame of thinking because I was sort of looking at that particular place and context of time. But the sense which I have to this question is uh, the India of 1950s was very different. And, and Nehruvian generation really sort of took it upon themselves. They were really recently decolonized. And there was this sense that they had to build a new India, right? Uh, we tend to, we, we sort of 50 years out from, from that point in time, and we tend to sort of discount this. But remember, this was essentially, so several of these planners, uh, uh, the, the seven young planners who worked at Delhi Master Plan, one of them had come to school here in the Landscape Architecture Department, one at Urbana, one at Berkeley. So these guys really took it upon themselves that they need to lay out, lay down the planning framework. So they were essentially laying down the entire framework within which Indian cities would be planned. Um, so this, and this kind of a backlash, um, that the idea would be changed at a very fundamental level, uh, was probably not expected, especially from their perspective. Today, I think the, the difference is that the, that the younger generations of Indians are much more confident, and they do not see really, they do not need to translocate by saying, this is like the Mohalla or the Kucha, they would be like, you know, this is a skyscraper as good as in downtown Boston or Loop in Chicago or I don't know, World EC Page. So there is, that's the sense I have, that there is that, uh, there is a, a, a confidence within, with, within which these ideas today circulate and, and they are not really seen as foreign increasingly by, by a large section of planners. So there are sensitivities involved, some, um, <coughs> especially, uh, especially as Rahul's book talk about it, um, there is also a, a whole set of, of con, the, the whole confidence sort of also shows up in rediscovering uh, a typology like the Indian temple, right? Mm -hmm. and, and sort of recreating it with, with, with much um, more of panache than somebody would have done in 1960s and 70s, right? So there is, I, I sort of see that as, as a big difference in, in, in from I mean, a quick comment before we open it up, but I mean, I think one difference is to respond to your question in the post-liberalization uh, era in the 1990s is, uh, I think, as, 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 as socialism sort of drops out of our political agenda uh, and our infrastructure becomes more expansive, uh, I think the ability for now the middle class <coughs> to isolate themselves from the condition of subversion, which uh, of even the poor in the form of the special economic zones or the gated communities, is actually, actually accelerating. So it's interesting that uh, in socialist India, uh, uh, I mean, although these paradigms are sort of superimposed there, the reality could encroach upon it. Today, I think the ability to create gated communities, mm -hmm. to use that word, yeah. is, is, and that in, so to so sort of secede from the Republic of India physically mm -hmm. is occurring more and more. And this would be a phenomenon that I think uh, might speak to what you're asking and might be worth a study, I guess. So with that, let's just open it up to other questions. We can come back to Sai and uh, Alex. I mean, it's just love the work. Um, as a historian, urban historian, and especially working in the United States, I, I was struck by the almost comic aspect of this, that you have this group of planners here who came up with something as crude as the neighborhood unit based on some idea that that would somehow, as you said, uh, acculturate people if you could organize just those five elements or six elements. Uh, but actually failed to get very far with it here. And so then they go and flicked it, and I guess that's what uh, a lot of post-colonial, there's this wave of planners and people who can sort of go to those places. Um, so I was, and, and uh, but underneath it, there seemed to be sort of ancient conflict between uh, the, the attempt to organize in planning that, that goes back, as you showed, the town itself was a plan had that grid and all, um, and uh, what I'll just call vital urbanism or, or, or uh, vital urban life, which uh, and now I think of Jane Jacobs and a lot of people now trying to work with it rather than against it. So I, those, with those thoughts, I just wondered if, if uh, that might explain this marvelous transformation of this area out of uh, the, the controlled scheme in mind to something that's much more like a, a very plant life going on, both, both formal and informal. Yeah, and I think that's, that's where 
I think we need more research, absolutely critically in that area to figure out. It is, it is something which has not been researched on. It, it's something which has always been sort of seen beyond. Nehruvian India turned its back towards the historical aspects of Indian cities very, uh, very definitively in, in, in some terms and looked beyond at the urban periphery, quite like the United States. Uh, we haven't had a Jane Jacobs yet, but, but sort of within that paradigm, I think that um, uh, what, I mean, I'm reminded of Man Fredo's, the Furi's work, who sort of, who argues essentially this, right, to think of that if these recent historical lessons can, can guide urban planning, which can sort of serve as a framework for urban design and architecture, then we can begin to make a sense of what happened and, and, and what does it mean in terms of city planning and design. And that's why this was a great venue, Rahul, for <laughs> presenting this. Kelly, sorry, Kelly had her hand. I didn't get it. Cool. We go next. Thanks. Kelly. No, I also, um, for me, I, I find this neighborhood unit concept quite, quite fascinating in the way it's, it's um, superposed to, to different contexts. And I think, as you know, Sanjeev, there's been also a lot of people in Leuven who have studied it in, in the socialist world context. And I just wonder if in your dissertation also, you looked at it from that perspective in India, because for me, I follow a lot of students who have worked particularly, say, in Vietnam and, and other contexts where they've looked at it from this socialist, following the work of James Bater, where he, and, and people like, in the book of Costa Marti, or, you know, the housing in the, the third world, where they take the, the neighborhood unit of Clarence Perry and use it as a socialist third world housing concept. And if this was a part, and for me, how this kind of almost garden city concept becomes then, uh, well, the way it got transformed in, in the Vietnamese context, and in many other of the socialist transformations in the way Baker also, in the kind of socialist city model in his book, it gets translated in very different diagrams that are a kind of functional city model, yeah. which is a kind of fascinating, perfect model of relationship to work, um, really the, the perfect socialist communist model. And I wonder if that, knowing also what you're saying of independent, independent India following a kind of self-sufficient economic model, socialist model, if this became also a bit, because I, I find it curious also seeing some of these projects how they, they have different, in, in different cities, I've only seen a few of them, but there are quite different spatial outcomes according to the different cities that they land in, in India. And if this was, if this kind of almost ideological, political point of view is also part of, of your thesis work. <coughs> I mean, the idea of, of uh, uh, this, it was, Supposedly so socialistic, but not really, because they, uh, by 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 late seventies, <coughs> the idea had sort of begun to come apart. They were uh, constantly running short of of uh, being able to produce adequate number of these planned neighborhoods to house people. There was a pent up demand, and and by mid seventies, they began to open up uh, the market to subdivide. <coughs> and then it sort of that's a part of the research I did not. Um, I did not show here, but then it sort of becomes like the ur American urban edge at the turn of the 19th century. The subdividers come in, um, the fly-by-night <coughs> operators, right? And, and so um, the work on Boston, uh, Sam, Sam Bass Jr.'s work, sort of essentially speaks to the same similar phenomena. And, and by mid-70s, it's a very different situation where the discursive idea would be taken, so that table. So think of designing a subdivision based on that table. But what it would do uh, very well in India would be to open up housing market for a whole range of people. You could buy a lot on uh, a five rupee monthly installment. It would be 20 kilometers out, it would be smaller, it would not have side services. But uh, so the idea of socialism probably held true for the most important cities like Chandigarh and Bhubaneswar and Gandhinagar, which were, or the steel plants, which were really within the realm of the federal or the state governments. But beyond it, most of the Indian cities, no. 
Are projects of like Raj Raval considered part of this neighborhood unit concept? Or I don't know. Or I mean, no. Raj, I, I'm not aware of any uh, neighborhood scale project by Raj Raval, but at the architectural scale, they would probably would have been built in one of the planned city extensions. The new Bombay is full of them, yeah, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. I found this talk fascinating uh, for many reasons. Um, but I'd like to hear you more, because what struck me in your last anecdote about, well, <coughs> if you break the law, it'll be easier for all of us. You just build your room here, and then you know everything will be fine. That's happened in Bangalore, too. But it spoke to me about sort of the failure, in a sense, of this planned Western model that fought anomie, or was believed to fight anomie, which Indians find totally anomic, because it seems to me that you're talking about an aesthetics of proliferation. But we like a lot of stuff. And we like it to be vital and overflowing and dense. <coughs> and what they're seeking is the good, I don't know if this is true, but it seems to me what this hybrid model, this matrix hybrid is creating, is a cross between <coughs> the poor and new urbanism. It's sort of medieval in the social networks, the crossing of the street but very modern in the sense of space, within the house. Am I right in reading you this way? I don't know. I sort of uh, think of this as a, uh, as a, as a very successful planning uh, enterprise, but the success lies in its failure. That it did not do what they expected it would become. But if, if the outcome of a planning enterprise is that people love the space which got created, then it's extremely successful, uh, right? And uh, I think in, in terms of scale, the anthropologists talk about imagination all the time. And I think the individual's agency shows up big time after 1980s, sort of gets traction after 1990s, as Raul sort of argues, in, in, in terms of ironically named uh, villa called Nirvana and, and that, right? With the Haveli called the White House. And, and that range is immense, and it sort of spans the entire uh, spectrum, which I think sort of speaks to the agency of the individual and what they do with, with their um, uh, house that at some point of time looked like socialist from inside and outside, but doesn't make you know. Stanford. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, first of all, I enjoyed it very much. I want to just apologize in advance. I'm going to ask a theory question in a way about <laughs> urban theory, because um, it's the main way that I've been cities. Uh, I was struck by two things in your uh, talk. Uh, uh, I'm also extremely uh, sleep deprived, so I may have trouble. I'm going to ask you to fill in some things for me. Uh, the first was the way you described the particular place where the wall in Jaipur, which separated, or in principle, ostensibly separated the, uh, the planned the probably middle class community on one side with the informal uh, community on the other. And you said, well, I see this, I saw this and came to uh, only able to understand it when I could see it as a single economy. The second part that struck me, and I think they're related in your talk, was your conclusion, when you basically gave us the conclusion that, that uh, Indian urbanism was a patchwork of uh, generally unlike um, neighboring, um, let's say, sub-threshold conflict, which essentially found a kind of negotiated, uh, I won't say harmony, but at least equilibrium. And I thought to myself, well, Jesus, you went through this formal presentation, you're somebody who grew up in these companies. I said, surely you knew that in your gut before you took us through the formal presentation <coughs> and then the conclusion. You would have known this in advance. I would have thought. You see, I, I go to India a lot in ways. I, I have a cliched uh, view of many things which I'm unable to get beyond. Next, something rem I reminded myself, because it seems to me what's at stake here, of course, is the relationship between you know, um, rationalization and the application of rational principles to the organization of, a, of populations and their settlement. And I remembered the extraordinary recent book by Amartya Sen, where he argues in talking about theories of justice that there is perhaps another way to think about justice rather than the 
the sort of Anglo-Saxon and Western model, in which he proposes an entirely different model, which I suppose has its roots in Hinduism and Hindu cosmology, where he says that you know justice would be organized, I don't remember the terms, would be perhaps organized around what was practically uh, uh, po uh, possible rather than you know sort of completely abstract and pure principles um, of right and wrong. It strikes me that in a way that's a different way to think about the material, social, economic realities of cities in India too. In a sense, isn't that an opportunity here to throw away the uh, pretensions of the um, adoption of the Western planning uh, uh, models and realize they're really critical parts of the ecology, but they aren't the dominant ones. They're really just pretty blocks. Yeah, they're the little pieces that allow the communication and the negotiations to take place in, the, in, those, in these cities. <clears throat> no, I think your, your, your observation is, is absolutely right. There is, there is a sense, and I, I, didn't, I didn't know this conclusion. Um, really? You didn't know it before you began? No. I mean, I, and, and that's the way literature frames it, right? Remember, between my practice, I had spent a good number of years, and most PhD students can vouch for it, graduate school as a student does stuff to you, right? And, and literally, we learn the literature and the way it is framed and the way Indian cities describe. Though I sort of always questioned it, but I had not sort of researched it at a fine grained level, which, which this. Um, I had, as a consultant, probably been involved in many of these appropriations, right? Um, land use conversions and, 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 uh, and things of that nature. But uh, what, what struck me is, is how little we know about, about the way uh, these settlements <laughs> coexist and have historically coexisted. Um, and, uh, while digging up the archives, um, one of the things which came out and which, which I need to sort of uh, spend some time thinking about and probably do a little bit more of digging around in the archive is that the city of Jaipur itself was planned. Um, the, the first few houses were constructed on these major artillery roads and the innards filled in over a period of time uh, without any formal planning. Um, and the, the local term for, for this was called Kucha Upar, that the wild grass grew in these uh, and people could come and take out that wild grass and lay their claim on the land. And this grew inorganically, and these houses were regularized over a period of time. So if that sort of serves as the backdrop, um, these poor are not going to go more. <coughs> Increasingly, the, the way political economy is shaping up, and the, the second phase of JNURM, which essentially talks about giving, giving title to people, because people vote, and that essentially has become such a major problem and within a democratic framework. I wouldn't claim that these are the best settlements to live in, the informal settlements. They probably uh, could have been much better if, if people had, if planners had thought of them at the initial stage. But they are not going anywhere, and they're going to become more and more formalized. So uh, the gated communities, I, I see Rahul's point completely, but I still think that it's a very recent phenomenon. We need to look at them 50 years down the line. I'm, I'm dying to see those temples in the gated communities and the way people would have done the things if this hypothesis holds true. So at some level, that, that's, that's, that's something less researched upon. I do not feel very confident to speak to the notion of how this pans across in other Indian cities, for example. Well, there are two things. They're different, but urbanizing India right now Number one is the enormous explosion of wealth and concentration of wealth in certain portions of the population. And I suppose other is the multitudes that will never really be incorporated fully. So you really do have a situation where rational planning should probably not be applied with anything more than the idea that it could apply to very local problems. What I mean by that is to completely accept the fact that the cities in these contexts have to, in a certain sense, uh, find their own ways, you know, build themselves. Um, no, I, uh, 
I mean, water supply, sewerage, right? So think of those where I guess planning, racial planning is, and comprehensive planning is successful. But but beyond that, if if, if new urbanism sort of rediscovers it, right, and the the, the neighborhood unit concept, it uses the same diagram in the 21st century to talk about about organizing this. Then I don't really know how far would that take. New urbanism does seem like master planning becoming the same traditional basis as zoning. I mean, this is kind of the, I, you know, I just, I'm sorry, I, I put it in there, but I, I, I can't help but think about, I teach housing questions in Columbia for the last 13 years, and our students, our architecture students who for a moment become planners, and that bridge gets crossed relatively spontaneously, maybe all too easily, but the propensity of a young designer towards the informal seems to me almost almost conclusive. And in looking at your talk, what I keep coming back to is um, that kind of quantifiable side where other things cannot be solved perhaps in any way without the rational either. Whether it's, and it's just, I'm not advocating it for it or against it per se, but the advent of energy questions, environmental questions, and the need for research and development at the front in a way that would be perhaps not so much anthropologically driven or in some kind of political hypothesis, socialism or not, but just towards resources. That, I keep finding those kind of questions, the, the anthropological questions getting reframed by an inevitable crisis around energy uh, and everything about class identity, access, health. So in other words, it's, um, I mean, I sort of try to push it that way, but the drive towards self-organization and the romanticism of the informal, at least that's where I see You look at me when you said that. Well, I'm going to bring with you, Roy, who I think might be in the crowd, uh, the Botswana project, but a, a, lar a large drive towards finding environments that are capable of being reflexive, reflexive and thus the informal becoming very exciting in a drive towards a more reflexive environment late in the 20th century, which is completely convincing and, and endlessly important, well, of which I think much of your writing helps create the milieu for that in a certain way, that the reflexive environment was, was not only needed, but was perhaps inherently embedded in us anthropologically. Um, but then with the arrival of mass society and you know the kind of technological change we desire to write. Anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's a brilliant, it's an extraordinarily brilliant talk, I think, and the, your sense of personal engagement and distance was immensely refreshing. Um, thank you. You had a question. Yeah. Um, um, I just wanted to know, were there other city plan frameworks, planning frameworks that were uh, thought of before deciding about the neighbor unit, going with the neighbor unit? Um, because I'm from India, and this is how I think of what, what I see. Uh, and it's everywhere. So I think, are there other cities in the country that did something different, or were there other options available at the time? Yeah, the big, the big model which sort of the British introduced was the civil lines model. Right? So think of big Bangalore's and, and ostentatious uh, setbacks and, and houses, which was quite like American suburbia if you come to think of it. Um, wider roads uh, and class based. But only if if, if you were. Um, a very well-off indigenous elite, or if you were a British colonial officer, you, you lived in one of those backgrounds. Um, and Nehru had, uh, before he had become prime minister, he, he had started his political career as, as uh, 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 in the Allahabad municipality, and Sardar Patel in, 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 um, in Ahmedabad. So they were familiar with the city level politics. And Nehru is very clear when he speaks about, uh, there's a quote from him where he says, all the little and big noises live, live in the civil civil lines, right? So he turns it back to civil lines completely. He says, they're too big, they're class-based. So these neighborhoods would have a mix of, of populations, and that's the way Indians would institutionalize it, quite unlike the United States, where uh, suburbia would become class and, and uh, <coughs> both social and economic class-based. The civil lines model existed as a rival, had been, it continued until 1960s in many Indian cities, uh, but then neighborhood unit concept sort of replaces it completely, making sense. So that's sort of the short answer. Uh, <coughs> Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm from Bangalore, and I'm wondering if you could 
And uh, of course, I knew about it, but didn't until I saw that road dividing the two and gradually uh, they're mixing up. Uh, and the notion of Amartya Sen, just got mentioned here, is Naya and Niti. Those are the two Sanskrit words. Uh, one is law, another is justice. And what you were describing is where those two are getting confused. The law is trying to do something that people don't think is just. And therefore, they will try to manipulate. But this, I don't think, is just India. Africa is exactly like that. South, Africa, uh, South America is just like that. Even China is like that. So then it is not culture-based, I'm speculating, that it might be more to do with, uh, it's too easy to say uh, uh, their income. I think it is more education. And uh, if you don't have education, people do weird things. Uh, I just heard three days ago a presidential contender saying that he just found out that China intends to build a, a bomb. You know, so uh, unless there is a framework of educated people, uh, then the, the dream, by that I mean when I see these big posters in India of creative communities, my god, they are absolutely as American as it gets. Mm -hmm. They are clean, they are fantastic. There is no slum, there is no temple. There, you know. So I, I'm thinking that you're being terribly sensitive, and I, I really admire you for that. But that which will happen may not be the right thing. So half a billion people uneducated, unemployed, except for having cell phones, is uh, the beginning of uh, Arab Spring. Uh, so, uh, I mean, what are we, you know, the sensitivity is very, very important, but the, the foundation is so huge <coughs> that I, I kind of wonder, should you be supporting this side of the street to let them do what they want, or the other side of the street and let them support them? I mean, if you if you don't know that, then uh, there's no model. Can I make a quick response? Yeah. Yes. I guess this is uh, no. This question gets to the heart of it, and and many uh, many planners who work in 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 in, in, uh, in, in development authorities mm -hmm. sort of speak to the same fear that what's the limit of subversion, or what's the limit of informality, or where would we stop? Uh, when does the idea of private property dissolves into anarchy and people take over all the open spaces in Indian cities, right? So that's the fear. That's that I, I actually sort of I uh, 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 I'm absolutely sympathetic to that idea. But then is the notion of of first figuring out what the what the Indian city is or how does it look like or how does it work before we even take a stab at planning the new extensions, right? I think in, 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 in the existing ones, it's already reality. That's what exists, and that's how it, it has developed. That's how probably that's the trajectory it's going. But that's that's a million dollar question. I'm, I have no answers to that. I sort of looked back in terms of figuring out where it started from. So I will start, it was sort of contemporary history, trying to figure out why does it look like this, and going back and realizing that it was coming from United States in 1930s and 40s. I haven't sort of looked toward the future. Ram might be better off answering the question. I'm in the middle of off. reading an uh, article, which also has a book with the same name, called Jihad and the Black World. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it really explains, the name explains it, uh, the, the tribal jihadis who are trying to hang on. 
and uh, the world of Nachamites. Uh, and the collision between the two is that road that you just spoke. No, it is much more soft. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is... Uh, <coughs> Uh, I think there are many more complex interdependencies here, which is, it's a simultaneous affinity and rejection, which makes the threshold much softer. Uh, and I think it's more complex, perhaps, than I think. Uh, but anyway, I, Sai, I'm going to give you the last question. And I'm probably just going to reiterate Rafa Rahul's point and push on it a little more, because I think what really came out, what really stood out for me, is this difference between morality and legality. That was the strongest point of this presentation for me. And that is the criticism of the formal master planning process as we know it, you know, the static land use document. And I was wondering if you had any insights on how you could productively use this history of appropriations of a master plan to comment on what is the flexible master planning process for contemporary India? Like any insight <coughs> on what this looks like? And probably the scale, right? So think of, of, of a city of three and a half million people. If we are if we are essentially talking about and I think US in that respect does much better job where the political jurisdiction is much finer scale. I mean which has its own problems and own issues of coordinating within an urban region, hundreds of municipalities, especially in states with home rule, but something at the level of neighborhood or the subsidy level. And then getting the, I mean, getting the uh, political, uh, <coughs> the political officials involved in the process, which at this point in time are not, right? So this is essentially the post-colonial framework, especially within the, within the governance system continues and the process is dominated by either IES officers or town planning, uh, town planning officials. So getting the politicians involved and saying, hey, what we need to do, because it's the same MLA who represents both of these neighborhoods. So I think these two is something, these two steps is something which we can probably start with right at this point in time. A smaller scale and getting the, the, the representatives. But you know, I just sort of, in conclusion, I'm just picking up on what you're saying, Sai. I think I was just thinking and reflecting as you were speaking is that in many ways New Bombay was, I think, a case where, uh, I mean, what was happening till that moment was these neighborhood unit plans were being done in isolation, not within a synergetic imagination of how the city would look. I think what New Bombay did, and, I, and the reasons why it wasn't successful, which I'll just mention in a second, but also picks up on what we were hearing earlier about you know, infrastructure, the, the uh, hygiene, health, uh, using infrastructure of mobility, of hygiene, health, water, uh, as a kind of common denominator by through which uh, it became a kind of neutralizing instrument through which very diverse populations could relate to each other. And what New Bombay did was it took perhaps the neighborhood unit as, a, as an inspirational mode, but actually played it out in the imagination of an entire city of three million simultaneously versus interventions of these little projects all across. Now, I think the problem, that, and, and I think Korea's Belapur housing, for example, was a great example of, of the self-help housing site and services <coughs> taken and actually resonating at the level of the city. What it didn't do was it, it swung perhaps too much to the other extreme. So it didn't have, uh, if for that same armature of infrastructure, which became the, 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 the instrument by which people related to it, it didn't imagine that in the three dimension, which means it did not give that architectural vision. And so it sort of neutralized it into a very abstract yeah. kind of thing. So therefore, when you go to New Mumbai, there is, there, there is no place there. Uh, but I think the principles, uh, if, I, I think this is a time to study them because it's 30 years uh, in terms of time. And uh, I think there is some learning embedded there, not enough scholarship on that. So it might connect some of these questions. So with that, I just want to thank you, Sanjeev. Thanks very much. <laughs>